Alberto Carvalho, for 14 years, has served as Miami-Dade County's superintendent of our public schools, the fourth largest uh, school system in the country. Imagine being in charge of 346,000 students, 52,000 employees from multiple countries, uh, so many different languages, cultures. No es fácil. It's not easy. In all, all that without moving a single hair. I would say, on his impeccably groomed head. Uh, this man is a leader, a true leader in education and in swag. Perhaps that's why New York City first wanted him as uh, their leader in education, uh, tried to lure him away from South Florida, and ultimately Los Angeles did. And now he will be in charge of the second largest school district in the nation. This is Hola, my name is with Alberto Carvalho. Hola, my name is. Hola, my name is. Hola. Hola, my name is. My name is. My name is. My name is. Hola, my name is Alberto Carvalho, proud superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Alberto, I, I can comfortably call you Alberto because I consider you. Uh, you're my friend and brother. You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> you just defined it well. And uh, I have a lot of acquaintances in, in the industry and in the community. But to consider Alberto Carvalho uh, a friend for those of, uh, of us that know him uh, more uh, deeply and more personally, although he's an, he's an open book and very transparent. So if you the Alberto Carvalho you see on TV, the Alberto Carvalho you see in a classroom, the Alberto Carvalho you see... Uh, Sitting here is the I've got Alberto Carvalho that you that you that you get. Um, you you came to the United States as an undocumented immigrant. You worked in, in construction in restaurants as a, as a dishwasher. You're the one and only six family of six kids, right? That graduated high school. What are you most proud of? I'm actually most proud of the father I had, and the fact that I'm living two lives: one that I'm destined to live by my own ambitions and dreams and aspirations; the other one, trying to live the life that my father should have lived. And because of lack of opportunity, poverty, a true oppression, he wasn't able to. So I'm proud of the fact that I'm my father's son. And because of that, I have created many moments through which I demonstrate pride and satisfaction in my own life. I'm proud of the fact that at the end of the day, I'm a teacher. I'm proud of the fact that only in this country could somebody go from being an undocumented poor immigrant, one of six who grew up in a one-room apartment with no running water or electricity, uh, to coming to this country, uh, roughing it for, for a number of years, being homeless blocks away from the office where today I sit as superintendent. Only in America could one build that storyboard, that journey. Of course, professionally, I am extremely proud of the fact that uh, I'm leaving this school system at the very top. Academically speaking, zero F or D rated schools, a district rated as A with a graduation rate of 94%, having won the Broad Prize, me making and designating Miami-Dade County Public Schools as the highest performing urban district in America. I am proud of our students. I am proud of our teachers. I am proud of the support staff, and that means everyone from the custodian to the bus driver. I am proud of this community. I am proud of Miami, our new American city, showing to the rest of the nation that it can be done despite the challenges. So I am proud of the father I had and all the inspiration that he enabled me with to be able to take additional pride over the work we've done in this community. Through your years of uh, leadership, you have a way of uh, identifying with parents, with teachers, with, with students in a very uh, relatable way, obviously, through your, through your own uh, struggles and life experiences, uh, poverty as well. We know it's, a, it's an issue in our country now moving, moving forward and just coming out of this uh, pandemic that I know has been extremely difficult uh, to, 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 to lead, and you've proven that. Uh, up against all types of weird circumstances, and we'll get into that in <laughs> in, in a in a minute. But uh, how important do you think that having had these challenges uh, coming up and coming from the background that you do, how much of did all that prepare you for the role that you that you now do so well? You know, there are two types of uh, 
two types of uh, relatable educational experiences. One that you get in high school and college, university perhaps, and the other one you get on the streets. You get through your own life, uh, life existence, the experiences sure. that you amass. Uh, life doing experiences. That right. Yeah. And I think I, one of the reasons why I, I, I so relate to this community is because I am of the community. Uh, I relate to this community. I love this community. The community sees me as a member of its family because my journey is the journey of many in our community both young and old alike, immigrant and native-born, English language speaker or not, black, white, Jewish, Christian, matters not. Gay, straight, it matters not. I relate because the community interprets and sees in me someone who has extreme empathy for the humanity of our community. Can you be an effective leader without those experiences? Of course you can. Is it easier for someone who actually walked the same journey? and saw the world through the same pain and excitement, through the same depression, oppression, but also a conquest of one's life? Absolutely. So I think that's the point of connection, this love affair that I have with Miami is because I am Miami, Miami is me. Uh, from uh, County Line Road to all the way to Florida City and Homestead, from Doral to Miami Beach, little Havana to little Haiti, uh, there's a point of connection, whether it's music, uh, whether it is tradition, culture, language, I belong to it. And uh, in return, it belongs to me. How difficult is it for you to cut your ties and move away from Miami now? This has been, from an emotional perspective, the most difficult time uh, that I've had. I've had difficult times in my life. You know, My days as a homeless kid, I remember those still. I'm still scarred from them. I'm no longer ashamed, though. For a long time, I was ashamed of that experience. You wouldn't... You wouldn't openly say that. Correct. I was ashamed. I was ashamed of the fact that, uh, uh, that I didn't have a home, that people looked at me and either saw nothing or saw something negative. I was invisible to some, and then to others I represented something bad. And then I become superintendent. I realized there are 9,000 homeless kids in our community. And I have loved every child, but I have cared, especially... Uh, through a, a purposeful dedication uh, to homeless kids in our, in our community. But it is a very emotional uh, time period over the past few weeks since I announced that I was leaving. It's been an emotional roller coaster. It's been, quite frankly, uh, uh, a bittersweet uh, departure. Yes, there is the excitement of a new system of larger scale, uh, but uh, the bond that I've developed in this community um, is one that is not easy to break. And in essence, I don't think it needs to be broken. Um, you know, I'm opening my heart to LA, but my heart will never close to Miami. Um, that's impossible to do. I have nothing but great memories, great moments, great reflections, great learning. Uh, so it's emotional, uh, it's, it's touching, it's bittersweet, but at the same time, it is exciting. I think that the children of Los Angeles deserve the same God-given opportunity that the kids in Miami have. There's work to be done. Let's let's get into that because you, you got an offer previously from New York and you turned that down. Now you got this offer that you accepted from Los Angeles. Why Los Angeles and why now? So let me talk, tell you first, why not New York? Uh, there was a, a, a disconnect that I discovered uh, at the 11th hour between, uh, quite frankly, uh, the way the mayor of New York at that time uh, would want to lead the city as far as education is concerned, and the flexibility as a leader that I would need to have to elevate uh, New York's performance. And I felt that I would not be an effective leader considering those circumstances. Match that with the emotional reaction that the community had at that point. Uh, literally, you know, protests to avoid my departure. Um, that touched me immensely. Uh, that coupled with my concerns about my ability to do the job in a way I know I can do the job, uh, convinced me that that was the wrong move at that time. L.A. was different. Uh, the approach to L.A., number one, was much more reflective of a community asking for me to go, uh, a board that demonstrated the right elements uh, that I interpret as uh, required elements for me to be effective, uh, a community whose demographic profile is very similar to Miami Days in terms of poverty, in terms of diversity but whose academic performance is not where Miami-Dades uh, is today. 
So it is that, that combination of newness, much larger scale, and opportunity for growth in a community that, like Miami, is the new face of America, an extremely diverse community, an open community for all. Um, that excites me. At the same time, I know it's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's learning the community at the same time as I'm learning the system, at the same time as I'm moving the needle of improvement for the system. Is it doable? Absolutely. And you know why? Because Los Angeles kids have the same DNA that Miami, mm -hmm. <laughs> Miami's kids have. They're equally bright. It's not that they're broken. Sometimes the systems of adults that are around them could improve some. And I want to jo join the hardworking people of LA, the teachers, the principals, the support staff, in moving the needle of performance uh, for kids uh, in LA. So it is, it is a decision that I made. Uh, I'm not exactly sure that I would have made this decision at this point. Uh, should internal and external conditions in Miami had not changed. It has not been an easy couple of years, uh, but it is a decision that I own 100%. Uh, it is a decision that I'm uh, looking forward to actually uh, enacting. Uh, but with that said, it is a decision that's brought some degree uh, of sadness because it's never easy to say farewell to your family, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Many have... Uh always thought that you were preparing for a career in, in politics, mm -hmm. that you'd run for governor or, or mayor one day or, or, or senator uh, or whatnot. Do you have aspirations, political aspirations in the future? I'm at this point 100% dedicated to the position of general superintendent in Los Angeles. With that said, I think there are many unwritten pages in my life's book. And I'm not going to predict at this point what the future will bring. What I can tell you is this, our country needs leadership at all levels. Uh, our country needs a greater sense of unity. Uh, our country needs courage in calling out that which is wrong and courage to make it better. Um, and I do think that there's a dearth of leadership right now. I do think that there, is, there has been an unreasonable substitution of decency of the ability to actually converse with somebody, of fighting for one's position without insulting the other party, the other person. Uh, we've lost our way, and uh, I am concerned about that. So my way of answering your question is, I have not yet written the last chapters of my life. There's a lot of life to be lived, and uh, I have never closed any door of opportunity that's ever been open to me. But right now, Los Angeles, I'm coming. Let's talk about leadership and challenges. Um, you went head to head with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on the mask issue right. to protect our kids in Miami-Dade County Public Schools and the, and the teachers. Uh, would you say that was one of the most challenging moments of your career? Uh, it certainly was challenging uh, from uh, the perspective of the possible consequence to our school system. That was a challenge. I never feared uh, a personal consequence against me. You know, I was threatened with my job. I was threatened with a suspension of my salary, the same for the board members. I was called all kinds of names. Uh, there were robocalls coming into the system from Texas and South Carolina. Second time that that has happened, or third time, one time because I, I fought for LGBTQ and, and transgender kids and their rights. Uh, and I was ca called all kinds of names uh, from all kinds of people across America. Uh, when I fought for uh, an undocumented teenager, Daniela Pelias, who was going to be deported. And this time, because I was fighting for, for the health and well-being of our kids and our employees. So I wear it as a badge of honor, as a medal, uh, and nothing more than that. But was it challenging? Yes. The threat from an entity of power whose position was detached from science and medicine and the expertise of public health officials. Death threat against our school system uh, was a serious one, and, uh, and it became very challenging navigating that environment. Uh, as far as me personally, uh, never once did I flinch, and, uh, and I am very comfortable with the fact that we stood tall, uh, and I think in the end we prevailed, until of course the law changed, um, and that's what people with power will do. When they lose in a court of decency, they, they resort uh, to the political power they have 
uh, to attempt to intimidate mm -hmm. or emasculate uh, uh, the opposition. Uh, when the school board in Miami-Dade County convened to replace you, there was there was talk that you left, uh, like there was disagreeable uh, terms and that uh, this may have been unbearable, I'm quoting uh, uh, for you. Would you like to address that? I mean, I can. I th I'll leave it. I'll put it this way. Um, I'm leaving my own accord at the very top, proud of the work we've done, um, with incredible love uh, from the community and towards the community. Um, but I think I would be cynical and dishonest if I did not acknowledge that uh, internal and external conditions uh, shifted. And, uh, and uh, I'm one who, above all, respects the work. And if I feel that the conditions do not empower the highest and most effective type of work that I can do, then I would be dishonest to myself and those I serve by attempting to do it under less than ideal conditions and circumstances. And I'll leave it there. I mean, uh, dealing with school board members, I can imagine, is probably not much more different than settling disputes on a, on a playground. <laughs> um, is there anything during your tenure that, uh, you, that you would have liked to have accomplished and that you weren't able to accomplish because of politics or because of differences? Look, I think we've done remarkable work. Uh, I talked about the academic achievements. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, number one school system, urban school system in America with a graduation rate, the mm -hmm. elimination of failure, you know, advanced National academics. and Urban Superintendent of the Year in 2013 know, and 2014. Thank you. Um, but let me tell you what's still left to be done. Um, there is a considerable level, amount of uh, social emotional support for students, particularly considering the, the pandemic. Incredible academic regression, learning loss as a result of the social isolation and connectivity issues that kids experienced, uh, the home insecurity and food insecurity that kids face in their homes. Uh, that forced them to lose a lot of ground. Uh, so there's got to be an acceleration of learning uh, toward each kid's uh, full academic potential. There's also uh, a persistent uh, universal across the country uh, uh, achievement gap between st poor students and non-poor students, black and white students, Hispanic students, English language learners, students with disabilities. We've made progress, but there's a lot more work to be done. The thing about education is that as long as there are children and they come to us from diverse perspectives with different linguistic skills, different levels of poverty, with disabilities, with English language limitations, right? As long as there are children, as long as there are communities, there are educational challenges. So it's a journey that's never completed. You never get to 100%. Uh, with each new batch of beautiful kids that end kindergarten, boundless opportunities and challenges arrive. So it's the kind of work that it's never done at 100%. So a lot to be done. I am proud of the fact that we passed two referenda that we built and modernized hundreds of schools across Miami-Dade, that we brought technology to the community, that we closed that gap of connectivity. I'm proud of the fact that this community twice voted above 70% to tax themselves to improve educational opportunities for students and the teachers, passing a referendum to elevate teacher salaries anywhere between 14 and 23%, catapulting them uh, to above national average in terms of compensation. But therein lies another opportunity. Yes, they're making more than they ever made, but they need to make a lot more. And we need to do the same for custodial staff and bus drivers and our police officers. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot, uh, but uh, Enrique, there's a lot more still to be accomplished in Miami that will be now left uh, to my successor. In Los Angeles, that responsibility falls on me. Talking about your successor, there's been a lot of criticism to the, to this, to the way it went. Uh, about choosing uh, him. Some people feel, feel that that happened uh, too, too fast, and some feel it wasn't transparent. Do you agree with those comments, or do you think it was done uh, correctly? I agree with the fact that, uh, based on the lineup of applicants, uh, Mr. Jose Dotras, in my opinion, uh, is a good human being, a good leader. A, he's a child and a product of this community. And I believe that he will do very well by Miami-Dade. Uh, the process on how we got to Mr. Dotras, that's a process that really belongs to the board. Uh, the board uh, makes decisions regarding the process, uh, regarding timelines. I am uh, more interested at this point in the day after. Uh, so Alberto leaves, Jose comes in, 
let's continue this momentum of improvement. Let's continue this accelerated opportunity for the benefit uh, of our kids. You guys have worked before. You guys know each other well. Um, but what advice would Alberto give Jose now? Continue to be the, uh, the strategic, data-driven leader that you are. Continue to be an educator at heart. Uh, continue to be someone who puts kids front and center on the stage of opportunity, does not compromise when it comes to doing what's right for them. And above all, have the political courage uh, to stand up to power, no matter how powerful that power may be. Do not be intimidated by political threats, whether they are internal or external. Be your own person. Lead from the front, not from the rear. Take chances, take risks for your kids. That's the advice I have given him, and that's the advice I would give anyone uh, who would venture into this type of position. And the most important things are the, the kids, right? And let's talk about school safety for, for a minute. Mm -hmm. Neighboring Broward County just green light, green lighted the, uh, their project to put medical, uh, metal detectors mm -hmm. in, in, in schools. I mean, it's just, even, even when I say it and I explain it and, and when I'm reading the news or I'm sharing that with, with, with my listeners, it's, it just does not seem real that we're talking about schools and, and metal detectors, but it's a sign of the times, an unfortunate sign of the times. Is that the right direction in your opinion? Do, are we, do, do all schools moving forward, are all schools moving forward gonna look like a TSA line, you know, when we fly? Uh, shame on us if we actually allow uh, conditions and circumstances in our schools to become that. Uh, why not make significant investments in the root causes that lead to school violence or community violence? Uh, why not really identify the root causes and address them once and for all? Why not adopt policies that mitigate and reduce the easy access to guns that both adults and in some cases young adults uh, easily have access to. Why not first take those steps or at the very least take those steps simultaneously uh, with the fortification of schools? Why not? Why do we all of a sudden jump to the most costly and the most intrusive um, step that anyone could envision? Why not actually take the steps that the experts tell us we should take. Addressing uh, the social gaps in, in our communities, reducing access that young people have uh, to, to tools of violence, mm -hmm. uh, eliminating uh, you know, weapons of war from the streets of Miami. I mean, is that such a radical idea? Why, Why would anyone need to have an AR-15 in our community? Um, I know the constitutional protections and I believe in them. You're not anti-gun. I'm not anti-gun. I am against any policy that actually becomes a permissive tool that injures, maims, kills students and adults alike. How many more Columbines will we have? How many more Virginia Techs will we have? How many more Parklands will we accept? And this is not just high schools. We're talking about, in some cases, the most horrific case, killing children, young elementary age children. What would it take for us to find a better way? So look, I believe in a balanced approach, Enrique. I believe that the presence of, of uh, law enforcement entities or specially trained entities that can ensure a safe learning environment, uh, that is an important consideration. But I also believe that uh, early intervention from a preventative measure uh, or perspective with counselors, school psychologists, social workers that work in the school and with the families is critically important that elevate the student voice. Secondly, um, I do believe that to the extent possible in a non-intrusive way, there are technologies that we ought to take advantage of. But when those become overpowering and when we believe that because we added all that technology and all that protection, that we eliminated the risk, law enforcement itself will tell you, you did not. Look, in South Florida, across Florida, our schools are not like a, a brownstone uh, school in Chicago or, or in the Bronx. Uh, these are tropically designed schools, mm -hmm. okay? And we ought to r realize and recognize 
if a child, unfortunately, wants to introduce a firearm into a school, bypassing the front door where you may have an officer with a wand, they'll be able to do that. All they have to do is throw it over the fence or under the fence, and then at lunchtime, retrieve it. What have we solved? We solved nothing. So what do we do? Uh, do we now put armed guards in the areas of recess so that we have eyes on kids all the time? It is impossible. It is impossible. So there are better ways uh, if, in fact, we have the political courage to do what's right. Something more practical, of course. Exactly. Your thoughts of the, there's already cameras in schools, and now there's a big debate in, in the country about adding microphones to record what happens in the classroom. Is that, is that a good direction to go in? To the extent that technology is used for students, for example, during the pandemic, who are quarantined, it allows teachers through a consensual, respectfully negotiated within the parameters that are reasonable right to connect with the students from a distance, it makes sense. To the extent you're using now these technologies uh, to exercise the power of big brother, right? Um, then it's wrong. To the extent you're using those technological tools uh, to interfere, to evaluate, I think it undermines the trust we need in the classroom between the teacher and the students. So I think there's a balance as far as the use of technology that does not hurt in the environment or uh, does not hurt the relationship of trust and honesty between a teacher, the students, the teacher, the parents, the, stu the teacher, and the administration. I'm not exactly sure, I actually doubt that uh, this direct oversight um, is necessarily healthy uh, in a school environment. On one of your send-offs recently. By the way, that's not the way we learned, right? No, and I just think that also to the, it's going to get to the point where if that, I mean, you have law enforcement was very resistant to having body cams, right, mm -hmm. initially. But then we've seen the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Even officers have seen the benefit of people filing false claims or false complaints against them. And they simply go back to the footage and you can see exactly what happened. And a lot of those complaints go, go nowhere. They're, they're unfounded. But it gets to the point now you have cameras in cars, you have cameras at the intersections, you have cameras in the schools. And if, you know, if I were a parent and now I find out that my, there's no privacy in the, in, in the classroom, then when the, what's next? The parents are going to put body cams on their kids and send them off to school. You know, it gets to the point where it's, it's almost ridiculous. Yeah. I think we would be better served if there were cameras uh, with audio 24-7 in the offices of uh, elected officials. Uh, you know, that's uh, a great idea. Yeah, members of Congress. I doubt and, they'll uh, accept it, though. And state houses, uh, because, I mean, that's where the fate, those are the rooms where it happens. And, and I think uh, we don't know really what happens or how it happens. Any particular governor or senator or, or that you'd like to no, put that camera in their just, office? Just a simple idea. Yeah? Just sure. a simple idea. Nobody want to mention <laughs> <laughs> in one of your recent send-offs, uh, you, you told a group of students, keep inspiring one another and show the world your greatness. Mm -hmm. Who inspires Alberto Carvalho today? Um, as I said earlier, uh, my father continues to be my strongest source of inspiration. Uh, I love my mom and she inspires me too, but my father and I connected and I lost him uh, 17 years ago. Um, he was a valiant hero third grade educated custodian. My mom was a seamstress, seamstress also with a third grade education. Who Every day of his life, I saw him working uh, 14, 16 hours, never showing fatigue. Uh, a man of immense courage. I thought he was Superman. I mean, uh, um, I miss him every day. He inspires me still today, despite his very, uh, very humble beginnings and limited education, he was brilliant. I mean, he could write poetry, he could sing, he could build a guitar or a chair, a table, he could paint, draw, he could sing and perform. <sighs> he inspires me. Um, Abraham Lincoln, uh, I look up to everything and anything uh, that Abraham Lincoln did. I even appreciate his evolution in terms of mindset, in terms of his own political awareness, in terms of his own empathy. Uh, he was not born perfect, he evolved. And that's good, that's good. It's great. It's great, no, nobody is born uh, perfect. I have a big uh, issue with that too. Don't mean yeah. to interrupt you when people say, you know, uh, uh, 
So and so said something today, yesterday, and today they said this. That's the evolution. It's okay. We you That's live, right. you learn, and there's nothing wrong with uh, you know. We, we should always work towards uh, being a better person. You know, t- tomorrow, today, than when you than what you were yesterday. Right. And when you when you have that perspective, then people like Mandela are successful. You know, considering the apartheid condition in South Africa, you know, he knew that you don't keep a nation together if all you do is you persecute those who once persecuted and prosecuted um, to get to a better place. Truth and reconciliation are important. Yes, I did these things. I acknowledge them. And I beg your forgiveness. And maybe you will extend it to me. Uh, Not every problem will be solved like that. But you're absolutely right. Sometimes uh, we're held in a static way to the words of the past, not recognizing the opportunity we have as individuals to actually evolve, to become more empathetic, more accepting, more aware. Um, And I hope that people actually uh, begin to understand the beautiful concept of that. Uh, And we need it now more than ever. America is facing a crisis, a crisis of identity, a crisis that, quite frankly, in my opinion, threatens democracy itself. And uh, unless we give people... What are you most concerned for? in the country today? I'm concerned uh, for our individual freedoms. Uh, They are guaranteed based on our own perspectives that should be respected, based on our own conditions, whether we're talking about someone who's an immigrant, who's not a native speaker. Uh, I'm concerned about the empathy and respect we must have uh, for people of different religions, of different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, Uh, I am concerned for the viability of our country because of a narrative that is self-indicting of the processes that have worked for us. Uh, We have never been a perfect nation, but we can become a more unified nation. But it's not through insult. It's not through demagoguery. It is not through shouting. It is not by suppressing one's vote. It is not by insulting an immigrant. It is not by insulting one's religion. It is not by allowing anti-Semitism to raise its ugly head again. It is not by, once again, allowing a few, a minority, to be blamed for the woes of our nation. And I think we've entered that dangerous terrain, emboldened by some, for nothing more than personal political aspiration or and reasonable protection of the America they believe was better than the America of today. Having mentioned all that, reflecting back on your father that you compared to your to a superhero, to all a quick message to all those superhero moms and dads that are raising kids in public school in America today with all the challenges that we have where politics have unfortunately infiltrated into the uh, into the classroom and there's a lot of concerns of, you know, for the vaccine with the pandemic and and all the issues you just mentioned, what's your message to all those super, super moms and dads? And I tell you, the, and they are indeed the superheroes without a cape. And right beside them are teachers, our caring teachers, the inspiration of our youth, the fuel force of our democracy, the mortar of our constitution, the fabric of our flag. It is built in America's schools. But teachers cannot do it alone. That's why this partnership between caring parents and the schoolhouse is so important. If we have one chance at actually becoming this better America, it is because of the joint learning that happens at home alongside what happens in a schoolhouse. No other place in America do we capture the attention of young people for so long a period of time. There is the opportunity to actually improve the condition not only of children's lives, the quality of life in communities, but actually our America. So stay the course. Continue to invest and support educators. Participate in the lives of your children in school. Vote. Vote. Protect your rights. Protect democracy. Protect your child's education. And there is no more powerful way than through the full exercise of democracy that only works if you actually engage in it and participate in it. Vote, be aware, fight for your child, fight for public education. And I guarantee you, America will be better for it if an unremarkable guy like me can go from being homeless to superintendent. 
what can't our children do? But they will not do it alone. They will do it through your work, your dedication, and your partnership with their teachers. Will you miss Miami's cafecito, or are you taking a cafetera cubana to Los Angeles? Both. I, I can take a cafetera to, to Los Angeles. I already hacer, found... Con espumita and everything. You know colando, what? colando, colando. ¿Vas a hacer cafecito sin problema? Claro, siempre. Lo hago en, en Versailles. Me dejan. Okay. Te dejan entrar sí. ahí a hacer cafecito. And I already discovered Portos, okay. which is a remarkable Cuban-American uh, cafe in, in Los Angeles. I found a tropical cafe okay. with chicken croquetas, pastelitos de guayaba, y de right. queso. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm hooked up. I don't know how you <laughs> ate all that in Miami and you, you didn't gain any weight. <laughs> Hopefully you can keep the, the weight yeah. off. Also in Los Angeles, you're a very fit guy. You're always, you're always taking care of yourself and stay healthy. This is airing Super Bowl weekend. Uh, new territory there. It's the battleground for Super Bowl this year. Are you going for the Rams or the Bengals? Uh, come on. You know, I was going for the Dolphins, but they didn't make it. Uh, in fact, uh, a few days ago in San Diego, where I gave a speech, I was asked at the end, so who are you rooting for? And the 49ers were about to play the Rams. And uh -huh. I said, the Miami Dolphins, <laughs> <laughs> who are facing some challenges uh, right yes. now that I think uh, we need to dedicate some, some, uh, some conversation and reflection on. Without a doubt. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm going to be rooting for the Rams. Uh, uh, You know, it's the it's the Los Angeles team. I'll be rooting for them. I hope they win. Uh, but uh, expect to see me here also watching, you know, our beloved Miami Heat and uh, and the Dolphins and the Marlins. Uh, listen, I'm a 305 guy, and they can't take the 305 guy out of the city, but he cannot take the city out of the guy. <laughs> I love it. Last question. I always uh, have my guests on the podcast leave a, a, a question for my next guest without knowing who that guest is. Mm -hmm. And my last guest was Dominican actor uh, Manny Perez. And the question he leaves for you without knowing that it was you. What would you do if you found out the world was controlled by aliens? I'd learn their language and decode their heart to the extent they have one. He's an educator. Of course he'd learn their language. <laughs> And now I ask that you leave a question for my next guest without knowing who that person is going to be. Do you think that before we get to Mars, we should fix the Earth and how? I'd say yes, of course. Let's figure out things here first. I'm all about exploration. Yeah. I love what we're doing and where we're headed. But uh, let's, we need to, there's a lot we need to figure out here at home. Yeah. Alberto Carvalho, I wish you all the best, the best my, my friend. I know you're taking that same energy, that same uh, heart, that compassion, that... Uh, passion with which you lead so 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 greatly and i know you're going to do great things for los angeles thank you very much Enrique. thank you my brother all the best appreciate it alberto carvalho hola my name is my name is hola my name is my name is <laughs>